our mission is to bring the best of Mexico to the world. And that obviously starts with food. Our hope is that it becomes more than food, that at one point we bring a little bit of culture in every bite. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I am so thrilled to have my next guest here. We have Miguel Leal, who is the co-founder and CEO of Somos Foods. And you may not have heard of Somos Foods yet, but it is absolutely incredible. I am such a Mexican food snob, I will say it. And uh, when I got to try... Uh, my friend Miguel's company um, products, I was blown away. I mean, it was so, so good. So definitely you need to uh, pick up some of these different uh, products that he has. He'll talk a lot more about it because it truly is authentic um, Mexican food. Uh, so really, really great. So after working with incredible brands, including most recently, he was the CMO for Kind Snacks, uh, which I think most people are familiar with, he decided to finally do his own startup and partnered with two other Kind alumni to build Somos Foods. And uh, I say finally because he was an incredible, incredible uh, CMO also of uh, Diamond Foods, and he's also uh, worked at uh, Cholula and lots of other incredible, incredible brands out there that um, really understands how to get a brand out there, but also um, make people aware of the great greatness of these companies. So um, all of the ingredients for Somos are locally sourced in Mexico, and they use traditional methods uh, of preparing their ingredients. And he'll talk a lot more about that too. So without further ado, Miguel, I just want to welcome you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Cara. It is so great to see you. And thank you for having me on your podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to hear a little bit more about uh, you growing up and uh, what was life like for you and and where did you grow up? Yeah, so I grew up in Monterrey, which is in the northeast of Mexico, about 100 miles south of the Texas border. And, um, you know, my family is actually from a border town called Nuevo Laredo. So I used to go and see you know, my grandma and my great grandma, my family there, we would cross the border to Laredo, Texas, and we would go to the HEV in the border and the Walmart. And even since I was a kid, I was always so impressed with the number of skills and varieties that I was able to find in cereal or even, you know, items that didn't exist in Mexico, like you know, cottage cheese or peanut butter or fish sticks. And it was a, a big part of growing up, you know, these trips to the border and being able to go to the store. And my mom would always let me, you know, buy one item. And I think, you know, I always love it, created a big impact on me. I went to engineering school. Then I came for graduate school to the U.S. where I met my wife. My wife is from Michigan and uh, ended up staying here working in the food industry, you know, worked at uh, Danone, worked at Pepsi, and, uh, you know, eventually, you know, became the head of marketing at Kind, where I met Daniel and Rodrigo, my co-founders. And uh, like you mentioned, always wanted to uh, start a business, and, and really Somos became a very personal project for, for Daniel and I. We had been talking about this project for a couple of years, two, three years now. And we, you know, I'll tell you more about it, but just to be able to tell the story of Mexico through its food, we feel like this is a story that hasn't been told. And we would love for Somos to, to be, the, you know, a part of telling that story. That's incredible. So obviously you've you've worked with bigger companies. Uh, what's the smallest company you've come into, I guess, as you know, you're an incredible marketer and leader. Um, you know, what is the smallest one you've you've worked on before starting? You your know, own? actually, 
after business school, I was following my wife's careers, which was the you know, main breadwinner in our family, and uh, moved us to Texas, where I ended up starting a company from scratch. So we did that company for five years. It was on paper converting. So we did, you know, like the paper that goes into the subway oven when you ask for a heated sub or, you know, the bags for McDonald's or the wraps oh. for Carl's Jr. So, so we started that company. I started it from zero. We took it up in five years to about $100 million and made all the mistakes in the book. You know, I was in my <laughs> late 20s, you know, thought I knew it all realized very painfully that I didn't know anything. And, uh, but I think that a lot of those learnings, you know, focusing on culture, you know, not making, you know, bad decision in the short term, focusing on the long term are things that are coming very handy now that, uh, that we are launching Somos. That's incredible. So you've worked at a lot of great companies. You mentioned culture, you've started your own company in, in the past, but what makes a company exceptional? Ooh, that is that is a great question. Well, in what we do, you know, which is food, I think the number one thing is taste. You know, your products have to be delicious, and they not only have to be delicious, but they need to be delicious all the time. They need to be delicious all the flavors, and they need to be delicious all the skews. You know, that's something that was a big part of kind and i feel that is something that we are definitely bringing with us into somos but that is what requires to have a great company to have an exceptional company in in my opinion is really what we mentioned which is culture you know uh, here at somos everyone is an owner on the business and we expect everybody to behave as an owner on the business. Everybody has a position to at the table to hold each other accountable. And I think at the end of the day, that is really what is going to set us apart. I hope, you know, when I'm giving you an update on Somos in 10 years from now, that's really what becomes the special sauce. The, the culture that we are building and the culture that hopefully continue to attract great talent to the company. That's incredible. So let's get into Somos. So you, uh, Kind was sold um, it to, uh, how long ago was that? It was about a year ago. I, I lose track of time. Yeah, it was not, it was, uh, it was part of, it's part of Mars now. And the deal mm -hmm. happened in November of 2020. So about a year and a half ago. Okay, a year and a half ago. And and so at that point, you decided to, you had sort of been thinking about this, as you mentioned, over the years. You used to live in Northern California. We were just discussing that. I'm sorry for all of you Northern Californians who think that Mexican <laughs> food is terrific, but I will disagree. And Miguel backs me up on this. And uh, so obviously you, you were thinking about it. Uh, so... What else inspired you to create Somos? Yeah, I think Somos, you know, it's, it's probably a, a 10 year story. You know, Daniel and I, you know, we work together at Kind, but we've been friends for almost 15 years. And, you know, in New York and, you know, working together at Kind, we saw how much Mexican food at restaurants uh, changed. So in New York, you know, restaurants like Cosme or Tacos Numero Uno or Rosa Mexicano, they just brought more authentic, delicious, better for you dishes that reminded us of the food at home. But, you know, being, you know, people that work in the CPG industry, you know, we realize that the options to prepare Mexican food at home remain incredibly limited. Mm -hmm. You know, right now, you know, Mexican food, uh, you know, has really been dominated by Calmex or Texman cuisine. Uh, as example, you know, foods like, you know, the fluorescent yellow 
molded hard shell tacos that you see in stores or chimichangas or taco salads with fluorescent yellow cheeses and sour cream, they really don't exist in Mexico. And I feel, you know, a little bit in the U.S., there is often a blanket approach to Mexican cuisine and Mexican culture. But the reality is that Mexican food is very diverse. You know, we feel, you know, exposing consumers to the food from Oaxaca and the food of Puebla and the food from Baja, you know, could be something very interesting. And and I was very excited to to be able to, you know, do it also with with friends and and with a team that that we've worked together before and uh, to make this a reality. That's great. And so talk to me about the name Somos. Yeah, so Somos means we are. And, you know, that is very intentional. So we feel like there are other brands that uh, in the market that have done, you know, not a great job bringing cultures together through food. And we wanted this to be part of our DNA. Our mission is to bring the best of Mexico to the world. And that obviously starts with food. We make rice, we make beans, we make salsas, but we, you know, our hope is that it becomes more than food. That at one point mm -hmm. we bring, you know, a little bit of culture in every bite. And it's a small things, but it's, you know, our packaging is based on the Alebrije art form. And it's done by an artist in Monterrey that, you know, she hand painted the design that goes in each one of our bags. And if you order uh, a taco kit from our D2C service, we always include a playlist of Mexican music. We also include a surprise and delight, Mexican candy. You can see the weather on uh, different parts of Mexico on our website, or even we have a link if you want to book a trip to Mexico, you know, from our website. So it's really, you know, I bringing the best of Mexico to the world. And, and that's where Somos, you know, really comes from. When people are launching in the CPG market um, or a beverage, I remember when I was launching Hint 17 years ago, a friend of mine said, oh, I have a friend, uh, this guy, Josh Dorf, who... It has a flour company. You should talk to him because he's in Whole Foods. And, you know, categories, it really does make a difference. I mean, how they're, uh, how you go to market, um, how you, uh, obviously, shelf life considerations operationally. Um, how did you think about that? And maybe what surprised you the most? Because obviously, this is a very, very different um segment than than kind bar ever was yeah so you know probably we were thinking it the same way when we started working i want to say full time on the somos project i think you know our biggest surprise was the market opportunity and and to give you an example you know we ended up with a larger assortment that i would have predicted for our first year in business. And that was a result first of, you know, designing the assortment around the consumer. You know, mm -hmm. Mexican food is very popular in the US. You know, we know US consumers are using Mexican food, but, you know, we wanted them to be able to prepare a Mexican meal in a convenient way. We felt like convenience was a big barrier for consuming consumers cooking more Mexican food at home. So we ended up, you know, with this line of rices, beans, salsas, and veggies to complement and putting that meal together. The other surprise was the acceptance that we had in retail, you know, for a category that is as large as as mature as Mexican food, A, there has been very little innovation in that set, you know, not so a ton of, of challenger brands, but B, most of the brands that exist today either do authentic Mexican food for first generation immigrants or Tex-Mex food 
for mainstream consumers. But we couldn't find a brand that did authentic Mexican food to mainstream consumers the way Cholula, Topo Chico, or Chipotle, you know, have broken through. So those two were big surprises. And uh, and unfortunately, you know, the, the reception has been, you know, much better that we could have predicted on the on the retail side. That's incredible. And so when you started out, did you, you're based in New York, the New York area. Uh, did you start out local or what, what was sort of the, the, the initial plan? You obviously launched the company uh, during hopefully the end of COVID and, uh, but I'm sure it was a incredibly, you know, different time than maybe you had, you had once thought of, of launching a company, but I'm I'm curious what was what was sort of your strategy there on getting it out there? Yeah, no, it's it's a great question. So Daniel and I have a third partner, Rodrigo, that that joined us, you know, before we started the business. Rodrigo is just an incredible human being, but he was also the head of product and innovation at Kind. For mm-hmm. personal reasons, he had moved back to Mexico. Uh, he's a mix of a chef and a food scientist. And he comes from a long family of chefs. You know, uh, many people in his family, including his mom, uh, are chefs. And he had a food business before he came to Kind. So the fact, you know, that, that we trust him, that he's so good, and that he lived in Mexico when we were starting the company, he's still living in Guadalajara, was just very fortuitous for us. So we started with Rodrigo making these recipes with his family and doing bench sample and sending them in the middle of COVID where we couldn't really leave our houses, sending them in boxes to Daniel and I. We would share them with our families and And we just fell in love with some of the Mexican process that he was using. The, you know, nixtamal corn that we use in our chips, the, you know, tatemado process that we use for our salsas. And we thought, you know, all of these products were uh, incredibly unique. So we had an idea on how and what kind of pace we wanted to launch them. Uh, I think if you had asked me this question a year ago, I probably would have told you that my expectation is that we would launch, you know, in Texas or in California, probably with, you know, a couple of regional accounts. But the reality is our first two meetings were with national retailers and they gave us an opportunity to take our SKUs nationally. And uh, it's just been fantastic since then. Uh, We started shipping you know our first ship was to sprouts and to kroger which uh you know was incredible and uh and now you know this month we are open up with albertsons hev meyer superfoods harmons so you know we're in our fourth month since we shipped our first case and we are just very lucky you know that the opportunity is there and the trust of the retailers and you know we are looking to be roughly on 3500 to 4000 stores by the end of the quarter that is absolutely amazing congratulations i mean that's uh i think that's a great story though of so much of an entrepreneur's journey is not it's not planned right you may think like okay you're going to head one direction but you have to be uh, willing to change along the way um, and be opportunistic too. So I think that is a uh, such a great example of of that for sure. Um, so obviously you've been the CMO of some incredible uh, brands and and uh, you know just in multiple categories. How do you get the word out about an entirely new company that no one? knows what it is, not to mention the fact one that's disrupting category that needs disruption too. How do you do that, especially when you're when you're young and 
uh, you're you're trying to make sure that the consumer is going to buy it, right? You don't want to over market the product. Um, and how do you how do you do that? And and I I think that the other piece of that too, which I'd love to hear your opinion about, is the story, um, because I'm a huge believer that stories behind brands are really what people um, it it engages people. And obviously, Kind did such an amazing job with that that you were involved in, and Daniel was involved in. Uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that too. Yeah, so let's start with the story, because to your point, I think that is the most important piece. And then I can, I can, I'll be happy to share some of the challenges and ideas that we have on the marketing mix, especially as we are just building distribution. But we are, we are very lucky. I think one of the best stories told in food and beverage was Kind and the mission of Kind and to be able not only to have Daniel, but a lot of people on the marketing team on, and on the you know, Equilibra team, having that school has helped us tremendously. Specifically for Somos, it's going back to our mission of sharing the best of Mexico with the world. And I like you know, always to use stories as examples. So for me, the story of the movie Coco is, is something that mm -hmm. has given me just a lot of influence in the Somos storytelling. When I went to see that movie, I, I lived in the Bay Area and I went to see it with my kids who, who are American and I couldn't stop crying watching that movie. And it was, I was so proud, Cara, of, you know, it is so much harder to talk about the things that should be celebrated in Mexican culture than to make a joke, you know, on the things that, uh, that you know, maybe we don't do well, right? Mm -hmm. Or the, you know, some of the things that are misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So with Somos, I wanted to do exactly that. I wanted to, to replace that narrow view of Mexico and, and, and tell the story of all the things culturally that Mexico has to offer. And what we realize in storytelling is when it comes from a point of authenticity. For example, things as simple as doing our photo shoots in Mexico with Mexican directors. When we are formulating recipes, when we grow our vegetables on Mexican farms, you know, when we tell the story of what is really the meaning behind Cinco de Mayo, Every time that we go back to our mission and we get closer in the dollars that we are spending, in the people that we're supporting it, you know, we're going to talk in a little bit about marketing mix. When we work with Mexican or Mexican-American influencers, it always surprises us that that's when we get the biggest hits and the biggest traction and the videos that go the most viral. So, so I think that that's something that it doesn't matter, you know, what is the Facebook or the Google algorithm, doesn't matter if it was Kind or Kettle or Cholula, that is something that is just, you know, always going to be part of us as, as we move forward on the story side. And, and to your question on the marketing mix, on the marketing mix is very tough because, you know, typically with Kind, we excelled on PR. And I think as time went by and, and the brand grew, we became, you know, very good in digital and, and field marketing as well. I, I think here, you know, the challenge is if you go with an awareness tactic and you are only present in 10% of, of the stores or, or 20%, which, which we should be hitting in the next few months, that means that 80% of your dollars or your investment efforts are going to go wasted. So we really, in these early days, we try to get as close as possible to the store. Shopper marketing, trial. I feel like this is why Kind was so successful with field marketing. And that was such an engine for Kind for so many years. 
So we try to make the best products that we can with the best story that we can tell and then get them in front of consumers. Direct to consumer plays a big role for us in terms of trial and being that engine for teaching people how to cook. And, uh, and yeah, we're in the early innings, but uh, we are definitely very happy with the results so far. That's incredible. Well, I, I love hearing that because I think a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people have that question too, when you're trying to get the word out. And, and I think I remember when we were launching Hint, the, the challenge of uh, creating an entirely new category, unsweetened flavored water was, uh, you know, super challenging to, we couldn't just launch a billboard to say, unsweetened flavored water. I mean, we could, but it would almost be wasteful. People needed to try it. So you talking about shopper marketing and um, sampling and field marketing, I think is, is so, so key. So definitely uh, um, it's, uh, it's challenging. Do you think that's changed significantly with, uh, with COVID in terms of how you think about the, the field yeah, marketing I, and the I, shopper marketing? Aspects? Yeah, I, I am an, an optimist. So I'm definitely going to tell you my point of view from a glass half full perspective. But I think we started the company at the perfect time. We didn't do it on purpose because I don't think there's ever a perfect time to launch a business. But on one side, you know, there was not a lot of innovation through COVID. So starting the company last year and launching this year, I feel a lot of our retail partners are hungry for this innovation and I giving brands like Somos an opportunity. But to your point on the marketing mix, if we would have launched it a, week, a, a, a year earlier, last year it was very hard to do in-store tactics because it was very yeah. hard to get into, into the stores. And I think, you know, right now what we are realizing is, you know, people are starting to be a lot more open and maybe perhaps the, the pendulum is moving to the other direction. Definitely. So Miguel, I always ask all of our guests to share a story. Uh, hopefully you will agree to, to do this as well, that where maybe you faced a challenge along the way uh, in, in building your, your new company. So it shouldn't be, uh, you can't go that far back, uh, I guess, because it's, it's uh, so new. But while building Somos that maybe you just thought, okay, this is really bad. Um, in the timeline of Somos, something just was just really off. What did you learn either about yourself uh, or about uh, doing, you know, maybe how you had to change in some way as a leader? Uh, I'd love to hear about that experience. Yeah, no, that is a great question. I mean, you know, I probably, you know, if, if I went back, I would probably mention, you know, the business that I started that was, you know, not probably, you know, incredibly successful financially, but it was, you know, I wouldn't be doing Somos if it wasn't for that. Specifically on Somos, you know, something that comes to mind that at some point, you know, was was I thought it was great and then that it was terrible and then it was great again yeah. you know from the beginning we had this idea of premium mexican food you know we thought mexican food didn't have to be you know uh, cheap didn't have to have bad ingredients on it didn't have to be heavy or with a lot of calories so we thought you know, I've only worked in the U.S., so, you know, this was my first venture into, you know, developing a supply chain from zero in Mexico, that we would be non-GMO, gluten-free, and plant-based for our launch. What I didn't realize, Cara, is that, you know, those certifications don't exist in Mexico. So to be able to go and build it, and it's not only building it, it's a lot of it convincing, you know, Rice doesn't have gluten, but it can get cross-contaminated in transit, you know, going into, into our, you know, 
manufacturing partners facilities in Mexico. So how do you go and convince, you know, the rice growers, the transportation partners that we have, our co-packers in Mexico to to that that this is something that that is going to be you know successful and that is going to be worth their time and it was incredibly hard i you know second thought of that i i thought maybe we were not going to launch it or we were going to be incredibly delayed i think at one point and 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 mostly you know because people knew we had had you know success with kind and success with carol and success with Cholula and both, you know, Daniel, myself and Rodrigo are Mexicans. You, you know, some of the communities in Mexico that we were working on this project bet on us and decided to come on, change their processes, get certified. But they clearly were giving us looks that we were crazy, you know, and <laughs> we did it. We ended up launching. We were we were a little bit behind and this year with all the supply chain issues that we've had ended up being an incredible blessing because these you know supply chains that we've built are almost exclusive for us you know we're one of the only companies buying non-gmo ingredients and you know having gluten-free lines and you know d- developing all of these products so now that we that other competitors are having issues sourcing or with manufacturing capacity or even you know when retailers were going to give us a regional test and last minute decide to give us a national opportunity we are able to lean into that supply chain and all that pain has had incredible return investment for us and for our you know suppliers and partners that's incredible. What are the challenges of of like getting you talked about supply chain for getting your product from Mexico to the US during this time? You know, that is that is something that we learned with Cholula, you know, when we were mm-hmm. uh you know running Cholula before, you know, the exit to McCormick, what what we realized is there is great infrastructure for moving food between Mexico and the U.S. Mexico doesn't have labor issues. They do great, you know, growing vegetables and a lot of the raw materials that we have. They've been manufacturing food. There is a great network. You know, the one of the families that we grow vegetables and manufacture with, they are in their fourth generation in that business so you know a a lot of experience as well with cholula during the pandemic you know the category grew 70 percent and we were able to have the best otif rates across the entire category for retailers Hmm. and you know laura who is our head of supply chain uh you know she ran supply chain when we were at cholula and she's our partner here at somos so she is incredibly experienced you know, growing, sourcing and moving products across the border. And and so far, so far, it's been great. I think, you know, most of the places where we manufacture our product are between eight to 10 hours from deliveries in Texas. So for a lot of our suppliers, uh, a lot of our partners, not only in Texas, but in the rest of the U.S., we are almost considered a domestic supplier Hmm. because of that proximity to the border. So, you know, a lot of times when I talk to peers in the industry, you know, I I tell them about all this capacity in Mexico and I try to do a lot to connect people there. But uh, I think, you know, with everything going on, containers and Asia and Europe, I am very bullish that other brands, not only in the Mexican category, but in other categories, are going to be able to find a lot of success sourcing in Mexico. That's great. Great, great to hear. Well, thank you so much, Miguel. This is, I mean, so many tidbits there, and you're so inspirational to so many people who might want to go and follow their passion and and uh, really go and do something 
like you've done with Somo. So it's an incredible product. You mentioned many of the stores that you are going into. Uh, what is the website as well if people want to find out more? Yeah. So go to eatsomos.com. That's E-A-T-S-O-M-O-S.com and follow us on social media at, at eatsomos on all the platforms. It's and truly, you guys. I mean, I don't do this for every brand, but it is it is super super yummy. So everybody needs to go out and uh, get some Somos for sure. And thanks everybody for listening to this episode. Don't forget to subscribe, where you're going to hear from incredible leaders and creators like Miguel. And please be sure to send in those five star ratings. It really does make a difference on the algorithm. And I can be found on all platforms at Kara Golden. Miguel, are you on social as well? You know, I dropped social last year, but I'm still on uh, LinkedIn. Okay, there you go. So uh, Miguel's last name is spelled L-E-A-L. So definitely follow him there as well. And uh, my own journey I documented in my book, Undaunted, as many people know, launched uh, about a year and a half ago now, uh, where it talks about the journey of building hints. So hopefully, if you haven't had a chance to pick that up, please do. And we are here every Monday, Wednesday, and we just added Friday uh, a few weeks ago. So so excited to be doing that and really getting creator stories out there like Miguel and Somos. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Miguel. And everyone have a great rest of the week.